Welcome to our Sabbath worship on this last day of November, 2024. It's a, it's a beautiful day too, I gotta admit. This is a good season to be in Phoenix. A welcome change from the summer. Anyway, let me uh, go ahead and uh, just do a short prayer, and then we'll do our first hymn. I know I'm, I'm going to pray for uh, Linda for healing for her foot. Anyone else need any prayer? Justin, he's just sick or what? Ooh. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know what? I am really lousy with memory, so let's see. I'm going to write down names. We have Linda. And your nephew's name is Justin. And your mom's name is Dorothy. Any others? People in North Carolina, North Carolina, that were still struggling for birthday. Especially if they had a wrong yard sign out in front of their house, huh? You didn't hear about that? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, let me write there on North Carolina. Basically, what happened is, not everyone had heard that. They found out that, and this didn't come from like a low level, this came up at least the mid level, probably higher level. Uh, I forget what agency it is that goes around and after a disaster and checks out the houses to see who's, you know, needs help and who's, you know, at least, you know, they can give them the paperwork that they'll need to submit for insurance. They were given a directive and they followed it. Ignore the houses that have a Trump sign out in the yard. I was like, <laughs> and you know, there could have been something when someone in there that was like buying or something or needed, a, you know, like oxygen or CPAP filter or whatever. Well, yeah. Anyway, anyway, let's uh, start with that. I didn't mean to get into politics. This is not a political meeting. Let's just pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for every day that you give us, but especially for the Sabbath day when we can just. Uh, Set aside all of our concerns of the world and uh, just focus on fellowship with you and with one another. And we just uh, like to ask you to come here among us while we are fellowshipping. Please bless everyone here except our worship. I'd like to ask a special blessing today for uh, Linda for her healing, so that you know she can be here again next week. And we'd like to ask you to uh, bless uh, James nephew Justin heal him also we ask her special healing Priscilla's mother Dorothy you know just uh, all of these people could use healing and we'd also like to lift up the people of North Carolina and all the other places in the Appalachians that are still suffering from uh, the effects of the recent hurricanes that came through and now that winter is setting in, it's getting worse. I'd just like to ask you that you put your hand on all of these people and just uh, give them what they need. And uh, like I said today, just come in here among us and uh, let us fellowship with you. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, apparently you get to hear me try to sing. I think our next one is a hymn. 
I am a child of God. Oh. I, I, I usually, when I pick the songs, I usually go online and listen to a YouTube version. So then I post that so you guys know which one. And that's a different version. You know, I just thought, oh, I know that song. I, I like this. I liked it. Although, uh, trying to lead and singing kind of reminds me of a story that uh, my sister told. Uh, when she first married her husband, uh, I don't think he grew up going to church, but she, he started going to church with her. And uh, they went to a small church. This is in St. Anthony, Idaho, which was like 95% Mormon. And so there were very few Christians. They had a small church. And the uh, pastor would lead singing. And my uh, brother in law at the time, who's since deceased, but uh, uh, my sister said he looked at her after one song that the uh, pastor had led. He said, Well, seminary, they sure don't teach him to sing, do they? <laughs> So I'm sorry, I, I I never even went to seminary, so I really don't know how to sing. But anyway, let me uh, get out my trusty Bible here. Someday, I'm going to uh, open my phone to read a scripture verse, do the sermon, and Either my phone will be dead or there will be no internet connection and I'll be like standing here going, um, uh, Jesus loves me, yes I know. As the Bible tells me so, that's my sermon. And it's a, but that's not today. So go to uh, Acts 17, verses 23 and 24. And this is... Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, beginning his sermon on Mars Hill to the uh, the elders and philosophers that had gathered there routinely to uh, debate and uh, talk to each other. Anyway, he's telling them, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he does since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So I had to read a couple extra verses to make sense of that because I forgot to read verse 22. It starts out, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe, but you are very religious in all respects. Then he goes on to say, because I, while I was, Walking around, I noticed you had a lot of what he called objects of worship. They were idols, idols everywhere. Athens was famous for collecting gods. But anyway, let me do our opening prayer. I'll pray that I don't skip anything else. But and just pray for our worship. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and uh, for all bringing us here today and for giving us something to uh, think about in your word. And I'd just like to ask you to uh, be with me now while I try to uh, share my thoughts on your word and your work for us. and. Uh, be with everyone here while we worship. Just let us enjoy our time with you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.
Now, we have another hymn. Let all the world in every corner sing. So our sermon today is uh, actually, let me find, let me document that I'm actually basing my sermon on. Um, I don't know how many of you, I, I know some of you have heard of, and, and, and at least a couple of you have actually read a book called Eternity in Their Hearts by a guy named Don Richardson. Yeah, I thought you had said you'd read it. Well, while I was looking around and trying to figure out, you know, what in the world am I going to do for a sermon this Sabbath? I came across this. And uh, I don't remember exactly how I came to it. I didn't come directly to it, but I ended up going to Amazon. You could probably even go there now if you wanted to. Just go to Amazon Books. Look for Eternity in Their Hearts. And then uh, click on Kindle. And then... Uh, Click on, I think it says, you know, where you can read a part of it. And I did that. And I read the first part. There were a couple. There was one about the uh, people's, the uh, chapter titled Peoples of the Vague God. And it was about the Athenians. And how an altar came to be in Athens, you just said, to an unknown god. Anyway, um, I, I, I read that. I read that passage and I thought, you know, I just really, it was really, really but all jazzed up about it. I was like, this is great. This is, you know, like, I got to get this book. I gotta get this book. I can tell it has a lot of stuff in it that we can use for outreach and you know, to connect with people wherever they are. You know, we can start there. So the apostles usually did, especially Paul. And we can do it by finding what I, I, I'm going to call today Easter eggs. You're all familiar with the concept of Easter eggs? I'm not talking about literally the Easter eggs we color and hide for kids to find on Easter. I'm talking about a more metaphorical Easter eggs that a, a lot of uh, people insert into uh, their works of art or literature or music. Or in my case, I've, I've experienced, you know, game authors and designers leaving what they call Easter eggs here and there for people to find, you know, and enjoy and, you know, try to find, you know, see who can find the most. And they're basically little tidbits of knowledge or, or something that, you know, like I said, there's people and enjoy knowing. And, and, and the best example I could think of right off the top of my head was, uh, in motion pictures, specifically Alfred Hitchcock movies. I don't know uh, how much all of you know about a Alfred Hitchcock's movies, but um, when I was in college, uh, uh, I knew an English professor that ran the uh, theater, mo movie theater on campus, and just every week had movies to show to people. and. He and a lot of other people that I, I, I ran with were into Alfred Hitchcock movies. And Alfred Hitchcock left little Easter eggs in his movies. And basically what he did is, in every one of his movies, he played a little, a really, really small bit part. He was only, he, it wasn't like an ongoing part. It was always something that just really brief. He would be like, 
walk across you know the, the, the background walk across the street or something and or he might be just for an instant you know they, they, they pan to the crowd and he might and if you were looking for it and you fast enough you'd spot it you know just in that brief instant they were looking at the crowd you might see his face like like that and, and people loved doing that. And uh, I was looking at this, and, and I, I was realizing God has left a lot of so-called Easter eggs around in the world for us to find and use to reach out to the world and connect with them. It's, it's kind of an entry point for us to introduce the uh, gospel to them. And this whole discourse that's in uh, the book, Eternity in Their Hearts, describes how God laid one of those Easter eggs out for Paul to find like six centuries after he put it there. And uh, first when I was going to do this sermon, I was just going to read this part and then maybe comment on it. So I sat down and I just started my timer and I, I read it. I got done, I clicked the timer, I said, oh, wow. Just reading this, make a sermon that's long even for me, I mean, even before I comment on it. So basically what I'm going to try to do here is I've written a few notes, really sparse notes, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of skim through this. And it, 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 it's a story that he made up, the author. It's based on fact that he's just saying, he's just introducing characters that he's uh, created, some of them are the ones he's created. Others are actual historical characters, and, and just sort of to illustrate how that altar might have come to be there. And it starts off with uh, in Athens around 596 BC, there was a great plague, and they couldn't get rid of it, it just kept going. And they had, you know, like Athens said are famous for collecting gods they have idols everywhere they literally had hundreds at that time and they had made sacrifices to all of them and nothing was working and so they were in council and there was a fellow named Nicias and he brought news to the council from the Pythian oracle I don't know who that is, it's some oracle. Right? And uh, the oracle, you know, they wanted to know, you know, he, they wanted him to find out from the oracle, the council wanted Nicias to find out from the oracle, why can't we get rid of this plague? We've sacrificed to all the gods, you know, over and over. And, you know, it just keeps going. And so he said, he came back to them with, well, with bad news. He said, okay, he, he found out why plague was going on. I guess uh, sometime before that, there was a king named Megacles, and he was, uh, had to put down a rebellion by some followers of a guy named Cylon. And he got them to surrender by guaranteeing them that he would give them amnesty and they could just, there would be no punishment. So they surrendered, they gave themselves up to him, and he slaughtered them. So, so that's why. But they said, okay, but why, why aren't the gods forgiving us for that? You know, we, we have made amends, you know. And he said, well, the Pythian Oracle says there is one God who has not 
been appeased? And of course, they wanted to know who. And he said, well, Pythian Oracle doesn't know the name of this god or who it is. But I'm told if we go to Gnosis on the island of Crete and bring a fellow that they all knew about, he was pretty well known in that time, a fellow by the name of Epimenides. No, Epimenides, yeah. Epimenides, close enough. <laughs> and uh, he, if they would go bring him to Athens, the oracle thought he could tell them who this god was or how to appease it or something. So they did that. They sent Nicias to Gnosos and he brought back Epimenides back to shore at a town called Piraeus, and they walked up to Athens. On their way up there, Pomenides is looking around and he's going, he's thinking, wow, Athens has a lot of these. There are idols everywhere. And, you know, yeah, Nicaea said, yeah, that's what we do. We come in contact with another people and they have a God we don't have. We make an idol here. And uh, community said, okay, that's fine. But, you know, in spite of all these hundreds of gods, there is actually one unknown God who has not been appeased. But you have to appease. So they, he went to the council and he explained it to him and he said, basically, it's it's like the or, Oracle of Pythian said, there's one unknown God that you don't know about. That uh, I don't even know his name. But I know that you have to appease this God. You have to make amends to this God for what you did to the followers of Cylon. So he told them to go out, bring in a you know herds of, a herd of sheep, and he said they have to be good sheep. They have to be clean. They have to be spotless. They have to be you know no blemishes, and you know, you know have some white sheep and some black sheep, and bring them all here. But first, you know, pen them up for the night. Don't feed them. Bring them here. Don't let them eat, you know, like we always do in the morning. Bring them here. Bring stones and mortar and stonemasons. And then I'll let you know what to do. So they did that. They went and got the sheep. They penned them up for the night. They brought them and then they wanted to know, okay, what's going on? What are we going to do? And then Epimenides said, you know, I've got three assumptions I'm making here. First assumption is, like I said, there is yet one God who you do not know that must be appeased here. You have to make amends with that God. Second assumption is, this God is great enough and good enough that he can and will lift the plague And of course, right away, the elders went, okay, okay, fine. How do we get him to do that? And he said, that's my third assumption. If we humbly acknowledge our ignorance and then make sacrifices to this God. So, and Epimenides uh, had them bring the sheep out. He said, he told them, okay, we're going to send them out into the pastures, lush green pastures out here around the uh, hill they called the Acropolis. But, you know, later Athenians would build a Parthenon on top of that hill. That's where they collected all their gods and had all their, you know, altars and, and, and all that. 
Anyway, let me find prayer Epimenides lifted up the God, the unknown God, unknown to them anyway. And uh, before they let the sheep go. All right. Okay, here's Ep Epimenides' prayer. O oh, thou unknown God, behold the plague afflict afflicting this city. And, it in and if indeed you feel compassion to forgive and help us, behold this flock of sheep. Reveal your willingness to respond, I plead, by causing any sheep that pleases you to lie down upon the grass instead of grazing, hungry as they were. Choose white if white pleases, black if black delights, and those you choose we sacrifice to you, acknowledging our pitiful ignorance of your name. So then they released the sheep. And he said, okay, like I said, you know, let them go, but have someone follow each sheep. One person follow each sheep and let us know if it just lies down in the grass instead of grazing. Well, they did that. And lo and behold, certain sheep just started kneeling down here and there all over the place. And that was God using his own sacrifice, kind of like uh, when Abraham he was took his son up, as God said, you're going to sacrifice your son. But Abraham? Yeah. Um, but end up providing the sacrifice himself, a ram caught in the thorn bush or whatever. So God provided his own sacrifice, or at least he chose from among the sheep. And everywhere a sheep laid down, Pomenides told them that your stonemason's busy, build an altar here. And then, you know, they did that. And by the afternoon, the altars, you know, the, the cement, had, uh, the, uh, had already the mortar and dried up well enough that they could use the altar. But of course, everyone wanted to know, well, well this is just an altar. I mean, it doesn't dedicate it to any particular god. You know, should we put just some god's name on each one? And, and Epimenides said, no. Remember, we're here, you know, doing this to acknowledge our pitiful ignorance of this god's name. We don't want to offend him by just putting some other God's name on there. He said, just write this on there, on each one, right? Agnosto Theo. It's Greek, to an unknown God. They did that. They sacrificed. And lo and behold, the plague lifted. And they, you know, wanted to give Epimenides a bunch of money for doing this for for him. And he said, no, no, just, you know, let's just, all I want is a peace treaty between Athens and Gnosis so that we won't ever go to war with each other. And I, I want you to give me a ride home, too. But they did that. And the story goes on. Don't worry, it doesn't go on forever. You won't be here forever. But the story goes on that, you know, probably a generation or so later, all these altars, they, they just started to fall into disrepair because they weren't using them for anything. They, they, they probably continued to make sacrifices there occasionally anyway, just, you know, to keep plague away. But eventually they just forgot about them and went back to just making sacrifices to all the other idols they had in Athens. And in, in this story, 
there's two elders, really old guys, that are walking along, you know, the, the foot of a uh, mountain, like the Acropolis, and they're noticing all these altars that have basically fallen into disrepair or been vandalized or been pillaged for the stone or whatever. And they're remembering, oh, yeah, remember that? And they just decided that they would uh, probably be a good idea for them to uh, at least repair the one of these, the one that was in the best shape. Get some you know, stonemasons to fix it up and keep it in good repair. Go to the uh, elders of the city and say, let's put this in the city's budget and just in each year, make sure we keep this in good shape. Uh, just so, you know, we will remember the one unknown God who lifted the plague of Athens in our hour of despair. So they did that. And that apparently is how that altar came to be that Paul noticed when he was walking around Athens. Now, th this is where the story ends, and then he they actually cite some historical references that talk about this. There's a guy named Diogenes Laertius in the third century in a book called The Lives of Eminent Philosophers. He refers to this. Plato's book, The Laws, he mentions this. Well, he mentions that Epimenides, at this same time, actually prophesied that 10 years from then, the Persians would attack Athens, and they would end up going home in defeat. That happened. You guys familiar with, a uh, in the Old Testament, uh, with the... Uh, something called validating prophecies, where basically someone would stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, and people would say, Oh, yeah, prove it. You want us to leave your prophecy? Give us a prophecy that could not, you know, something that could not happen, no one could know was going to happen, and then let's just see if it happens. And if it does, Okay, God's, you're, you're one of God's prophets. If not, you're prophesying in God's name when you're not a prophet. We're going to put you to death. So that's how they would know a good prophet from a bad one. This is a case of that, I think. By the way, Plato also says that Epimenides, while he was there, rediscovered, or during his lifetime, I guess, rather, rediscovered many of the inventions lost in the Great Flood. I thought, there's another Easter egg that God left out there. I mean, legends of a Great Flood that wiped out all life on Earth are everywhere, all over the world, in every culture. And that's another way that, you know, a lot of people say, well, that just proves that the one in the Bible is just one of those. It's the legend. But, we might respond to them that, well, if the legend is worldwide, could it be that maybe such a thing did happen? And maybe one of those so-called accounts of this might be actually accurate. By the way, uh, Paul in Titus, let's turn to that, Titus 1. Verses 12 and 13. I just wanted to point that out to you. Uh, I think I have it here. Titus 1, verse 12. Paul refers to Epimenides, not by name, but by quoting him. And then refers to him as a prophet. He's basically telling Titus, you know, like, he's leaving Titus there in Crete. And he's warning him, you know, look, 
one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's the quote. That's a quote from Epimenides' poem, one of Epimenides' poems. And Paul's citing it. And he's saying in verse 13, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in faith. So, there's another Easter egg. Paul himself calls Epimenides a prophet. Epimenides did not know the God he was prophesying for. Paul thinks he was a prophet. There's also references, and you know, these are, I haven't read these, and I don't expect you to, but just so you know that there are secular sources for the story of this plague and how it was, how it was solved. Uh, there's some guy named Pausanias in a book called Description of Priests, and some guy named Philostratus in a book called Apollonius of Diana, both of those refer to altars to an unknown God, multiple altars to an unknown God in Athens. And then we come to a first century historian by the name of Luke. And he is, a, he was, he is a historian, was. Still around, he's just not on earth doing history work. And I always like to, you know, this is a little, little bit of diversion, but I always like to go back to uh, the very first verses in, in the book of Luke, just to read those. Because, you know, when people say he wasn't a, wasn't a historian, he was just a preacher or whatever. But this is how the, the uh, book of Luke starts. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, the word here the word is not capitalized it means just the truth the gospel it seems fitting for me as well having investigated everything carefully that's what historians do from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order which is something even historians of that age didn't worry too much about they didn't worry about chronological order as much as they do now anyway beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that have been taught. But anyway, that's my aside. And just uh, another quick reference to a couple other Easter eggs God has put out there for us. A couple words in the Greek language as it was used be before Christ hundreds of years before Christ. Those are a couple of words, Theos and Logos. I guess some guy named, well, Theos for the, for the Greeks, originally was just meant a god. And like, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I guess maybe I'm kind of speculating. That's why they uh, have in uh, John 1, in the beginning, was the word, and the word, you know, I, I should know it by heart, but I don't, was with God, and their version says, and the word was a God. So they don't think Christ is uncreated. So it can't be the God. Well, that's how the Greeks mostly used theos, and that's the word, on, according to this, that is in there. And the reason we use it, use that word as the God, he was God, not a God. God is because, because uh, 
just because of a, of a few really, really eminent Greek philosophers, Xenophanes, Plato, and Aristotle, used that word. Where they were kind of, you know, the Greeks were always searching for the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, the one that made, you know, the whole universe. And they, they use that word theos to mean the God. And the Jews, when they, later, a long time later, when they were writing the Septuagint, decided, you know, okay, where, you know, where they translated the Aramaic, I believe it was, and the, uh, yeah, Aramaic was what the New Testament is usually in Greek. They, uh, they wanted to uh, use a, a Greek word for God or Elohim. And they thought about, okay, what Greek word should we use? They thought about Zeus, but, you know, Zeus was king of the gods to the Greeks, but he was also descended from others. God is not descended, but they came to Theos and said, okay, they've used that word to mean the God will use that. So then there's an entry point into the Greek mindset, the Greek philosophy, the Greek language. And they, uh, and Paul used it, used Theos that way in his writings and in his preaching. And, uh, a, uh, an apostle named John, in his writings, used the word logos, in the word that, uh, I can find it if, if I can real quick. Basically, the word uh, logos means the word, but it also means truth. It means, uh, uh, let's see. Let me scroll down a little further, see if I can find it. I wanted to quote it the way he put it. It's way towards the end, apparently. Basically, almost there. Maybe I passed it. Okay, Paul or John used that as a title for Jesus because logos, you know, like I said, it just means word, which was he used it instead of memra as a Aramaic, Aramaic for word. But the, the the word logos meant to them, you know, basically to designate the divine reason or plan. Which coordinates a changing universe. Well, that's, you know, our Lord. Anyway, so the, the, the way he makes a point that we could read John 1, verse 1, and verse 14 like this. We invite a motorcycle gang to our. <laughs> anyway, John 1 1. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos, referring to Jesus, was with Theos. And the Logos was Theos. And then John 1 14 could be. Rendered and the Logos became flesh and lived for a while among us. Anyway, those are entry points into the Greek language that the apostles Paul and John used to get the reach people of their age for Christ. But I think God has left Easter eggs everywhere for us in our culture, in our history, our traditions, our religious beliefs. Um, and he tells us in uh, Act 17, I think it's, I won't read the whole passage. I was going to read 22 through 34, but I've gone on a while. So,
uh, they're basically there we go Start at verse 24. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation, mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him, or maybe motivated to grope for him by us, though he is not far from them. And here's the important part, verse 28. For in him we, and I think by we he means not just we Christians, but all humans. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. God has touched our lives. He is never far from any of us, even those who never believed in him, never heard of him. And he is left, like I said, I'm just calling them for this purposes of this sermon, Easter eggs, for us to find entry points into people's hearts and minds, for us to bring them both God's warning and the good news of hope and salvation that is offered to us all. We are his messengers after all. So, let's find those Easter eggs anywhere we can. Let's use them. Use them all for the purpose that God intended them, that I think God intended them to be used for. Anyway. See, even I, even if I, though I didn't just read that, I ended up a long sermon anyway. So, thank you for sitting through it. Anyway, I think now we, uh, do our closing hymn. Then we'll eat. I'm finally going to let you guys eat. If you stand up, if you want to, and we'll sing "How Great Thou Art." That's my choice. Uh, it was suggested that uh, maybe we should repeat some of our hymns every once in a while so we could get to know some of them by heart. So I chose, you know, well, every three weeks when I do the sermon, let's do How Great Thou Art. <laughs>